Hey, there's no place to have fun over here. This is a county commissioner's meeting. Stop that laughing. Okay. All right. Good morning, everybody. I'm going to call to order the administrative matters meeting of the Larimer County Board of Commissioners. Today is Tuesday, October 1st, 2019. I'm Tom Donnelly, the chairman of the Board of County Commissioners this year, joined by John Kafalis, commissioner from District 1, Steve Johnson, commissioner from District 2, Elizabeth Carter from the Larimer County Cork and Recorder's Office is here to keep the minutes of this meeting. Our county manager, Linda Hoffman, is with us at the controls, and Alicia Jeffers from the commissioner's office is with us to time the public comment portion of this meeting. It's a tradition of this board of commissioners to begin this meeting with a Pledge of Allegiance. So I'd like to ask you to stand and join us in the pledge. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. All right, thank you, everybody. Uh, first item of business is public comment. We have a number of folks who've signed up. Uh, first, um, I, Deb Bjork. Very good. Uh, Chris? Yes. Welcome. Welcome. Gentlemen, um, I'm here on two issues. The first one is that um, I sent you uh, an email in regards to what I was dealing with. And I still feel that we need to have a meeting and a request to have this meeting and do do this meeting because of the slanders and libelous letter that came out from the Department of Human Services that prevented me not only being able to talk to them, but the Internet and everything, which is completely is not my character. But they did a cocktail letter, which um, they just pulled in all the negatives, but they didn't put in what they did to escalate the situation. So I'm asking you, please have... Linda, the director, and Heather, and a advocate with the disabled, and my uh, friend who was also my POA at the time, meet. That's the first request. And uh, because at this point I'm meeting with an attorney because I'm giving you guys one last chance to get this straightened out. I've requested that you put a phone in the office because I waited 35 minutes before being seen at a at a meeting that I was supposed to be at at 10 and I was actually there 10 minutes early and waiting for 35 people to get through your welfare line um, until they get to me when this person told me emphatically that they had a 10 o'clock meeting. I got there 15 minutes after I was distressed. I'm not a flake and I want you guys to know that there needs to be something for the constituents there to be able to let the people know that they're there for the meeting, that they're there for. Okay, then the second thing I'm doing is this is completely separate and this is my new three minutes is that I've been talking to people because I went to John Kafalis' uh, Taylor Park um, presentation. Uh, we're going to have some marches on the county and the city and at the Capitol regarding anybody that pays rent that has been jacked up that's more than one-third of their income. Some senior citizens are, and are on Social Security are being ignored in this county, and we feel that because you have ignored the cries of the senior citizens, that we are here, and I need H-E-A-R, we are here. Hear us what we're saying. If you do not do this, you're going to be causing a revolt in this town and rebellion because we're going to encourage anybody that has had their rent jacked up that's more than one-third of their income to go ahead and start signing petitions to do, to do away with the cap that the, cap the state of Colorado has put on us and require this county to be able to um, make it so that only 1% of rent can be charged per year because that's the federal guideline on Social Security. So when you jack our rent up $100 and we only get a 1% increase on $790, it doesn't quite cut it for us. And you expect us to get a job and we're on disability. We have kids that are on disability at 30 years old that cannot su to supply those needs. And you are not addressing them. And if you're not going to address them, we're going to encourage that you be voted out. And that's where it's at. Um, the other thing is that we need to have you work on our behalf to work with these people. Eminent domain is often used by this county. And the trailer parks that you have in this county, you need to set, set aside as being uh, protected, like diversity areas. And if they're not, and the only way to get the corporate to, to listen to us is to say, okay, fine, we're going to declare this an eminent domain situation because we okay. need to protect Thank the diversity great. in this county. Very good. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go a little out of order. I'm going to ask Greg Leverett to come up this, at this time. Hi, Greg. Hi. Good morning. You know, I brought up that my phone's blocked. I can't talk to anybody in Larimer County. 
Also, Steve Johnson blocked my email, which I think is probably illegal with some of the late, latest cases coming. So I can't do business with Larimer County Department of Human Services. Now, that originated from the Sheriff's Department. Why would the Sheriff's Department block my email or my phone calls? Could it be because I went to uh, about the sexual abuse of my daughter and I told Brad Harkin that Linda Connors lied as a Larimer County attorney, which uh, Lou Gator said anybody lies they're fired, which is not true. When she's, she's made the comment that you would not know what your daughter said to your mother about her sexual abuse. When my daughter told my mother about her sexual abuse while we were all eating lunch. So what does Brad Harkin do? The great investigator at the Sheriff's Department to protect children from medical and sexual abuse in Larimer County. He goes to Linda Connors who says, oh, everything was fine. Did you ever call my mother to find out when my daughter said the sexual abuse? No. And then another reason they would probably block my calls is the stupid comments I get from these guys. It's obvious Brad Harkin can't understand the medical condition my son had that DHS said was a signs of abuse, Hirschsprung syndrome. Uh, Clayton Cross. He's sitting, sitting there talking to him about the Heidi Fernand case and other cases the DHS screwed up. Oh, where are you getting your informa medical information from? I said, my father. Oh, your father's a doctor. I said, no, my father's a veterinarian. You expect me to believe that your father is a veterinarian would know how an antibiotic works in a human as compared to a cat, dog, or cow? Well, you know, I thought you had to have a high school education. And <laughs> in biology, you learn all those mammals, warm-blooded mammals, same bacterial type infections. I mean, just what kind of stupid comments or what kind of idiots does Sheriff Smith hire as sheriff's deputies? Next one is Barbara Bowman talking to her about that. And she goes on, well, I've seen those commercials and those antibiotics have uh, side effects. And I said, well, most of the things you see on commercials are not antibiotics but drugs and are taken for extended periods of time, therefore build up residuals, which will cause side effects. So. I mean, the logic behind these people is just stupid. The next one I think that the Sheriff's Department really doesn't want to defend is Elliot Phelps' stupid comment that, well, it doesn't matter what the gram classification of the drug was that they were treating Heidi Furling's daughter with. They were using a narrow spectrum antibiotic. Well, first off, no antibiotic treats heat stroke. A narrow antibiotic means you're using an antibiotic for a specific bacteria. Since there's no bacteria, what the hell were those doctors doing? And how is he using that as a defense for the medical malpractice of those doctors in that case? And Steve, I mentioned it all the time, you should have understood this, so this you should have spoke out. And you really do, by being in the same profession as my father, I think you owe him an explanation okay. as to why you support such corruption and incompetence with the Department of Human Services. All right. Thank you, Greg. All right. Now we're going to go to uh, Deb York. Hi. You absolutely can. Thank you, man. Hi, I'm Deb Bjork. Thanks for um, allowing me to speak today. Uh, the paper that I just handed out to you was given to the Larimer County Oil and Gas Task Force on August 15th. And I just wanted to bring it in to show that while noxious um, nitrogen oxide emissions have reduced the amount from oil and gas in, from 2011 to 2017 have actually almost doubled. So there was some discussion, confusion about what we were talking about in terms of ozone causing chemicals. And so I, I just also want to point out that in this same slide that was presented um, by Tom Butts, um, prepared by um, the CDH, Colorado Department of Health and Public um, environment, that it also is, the, we're talking about tons per day of, of um, nitrogen oxide that goes into the uh, atmosphere in Colorado. So while it went from 320.8 tons per day in 2011, it's now 219.7 tons per day going into our atmosphere. So it's like going from an F minus to an F. It's still not great. Um, and that um, when we talk about um, NOx, what we're talking about is nitro nitrogen oxides which react to sunlight to create ground level ozone. So that is what our problem is with breathing here. 
We also have volatile organic compounds that are released, including benzene, toluene, I can't even pronounce some of these, um, which are listed as hazardous air pollutants under the Clean Air Act. Methane, a greenhouse gas that's many times more powerful than carbon dioxide and a significant contributor to global clim climate change, and hydrogen sulfide. So ozone is formed when emissions from other pollutants like nit nitrogen oxides and volatile organic compounds react with sunlight. So in fact, we have the uh, carbon dioxide pollution coming from I-25. Then we have also the emissions from the oil and gas fracking, primarily uh, Larimer County, but we certainly in Larimer, or primarily Weld County, we certainly don't want to add to that. And then in actually what happens um, is that at night, so we think it happens during the day because the sunlight helps um, actually bind the molecules together, but actually at night in the atmosphere because of the inversion, it mixes. And some of the worst pollution cr is created at night. I would also want to direct you to um, this form, this I'm going to hand out to you, that the exposure to ozone is serious concern that actually is like causing a sunburn on your lungs. And it doesn't just affect people with asthma, it affects healthy young adults as well. And that study is cited in this handout that I'm giving to you. Very good. Thank you, Deb. Yep. And we'll shoot them all across this Oh, wonderful. Good yeah. job. I've you did a great a job, like an old pro. <laughs> Thank you. There you go, John. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Georgia Locker. Hi. Hello. How are you? Thank you. I'm here also as far as oil and gas is concerned. I'm very concerned about the recommendations that are likely to come from a group of 15 persons concerning oil and gas drilling and wells due to the fact that a large majority of the participants are cho uh, chosen by the commissioners are connected with oil and gas companies. I wish to ask that all recommendations consider the below issues. One, safety for all children from birth into the teens make it necessary for them to live at least a mile or more from wells. To do otherwise causes problems with normal growth of the brain and other organs. Children who live closer do not do well in school and have problems as adults in holding jobs. And actually, fetuses sustain damage when closer than almost two miles from a drilling site. Two, drilling wells first and then putting housing very close to those wells, like 300 feet, should not be permitted. It hasn't been in this county yet, but distance between the two should always be a safe one. Variance, as Windsor has allowed, is a bad thing for the health of those who live nearby. Three, drilling should not be closer than a half a mile from any water source, as per the EPA. Four, severance taxes for any removal of oil and gas needs to be raised to a reasonable amount. It's now between two and five percent in the state. That's better than it was. But other states, such as Oklahoma, Wisconsin, Montana, and North Dakota, are raising, uh, have a higher rate. And five, companies, many of the oil and gas companies are very much in debt. They need, I think, to give Larimer County about $100,000 per well to put into a fund for plugging and abandoning that well later. We do not need to experience a Firestone event in Larimer County and no one should have to wonder if they're living over an abandoned well. It has cost up to $526,000 to plug and abandon one well. Thank you for allowing me to express my concerns about this very important subject. And I have articles to back up that. Would you like? If you'd like to give them to us, you're more than welcome. There you go. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. No, that was just uncalled for. Georgia, now I have a tiny gavel here, and I'm not afraid to use it. <laughs> Thank you, Georgia. Good to see you. Okay, Luke George. Where are you at, Luke? Hi. Hi. Welcome. Good morning. Good morning. I come here today to express my opposition to gas and oil drilling in the county. 
for two separate reasons. First, as we all know, we're facing a climate crisis if we don't drastically reduce our fossil fuel use. Science tells us that if we continue to release carbon <clears throat> at the current rate, we only have a little over a decade before we bake in at one and a half degrees Celsius increase in global temperatures. We are already witnessing the damaging effects of a one degree increase, sea level rise, loss of glaciers and sea ice, stronger, more destructive storms, species extinctions, and disruptions to agricultural systems around the world. You can only imagine the massive disruptions that a one and a half degree increase will cause. Furthermore, disruptions of agricultural systems cause human suffering in the places where they occur and often force residents elsewhere. A recent study has linked the mass movement of people from Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador to crop failures caused by climate change in those countries. The simplest, most effective way to address climate change is to stop taking fossil fuels out of the ground. The second reason I oppose oil and gas drilling in the county is both more local and more personal. I recently learned that release of methane from oil and gas wells accounts for 30 to 40 percent of the dangerous ground level ozone along the front range that a couple of speakers have already talked about. I also learned that West Fort Collins is one of the areas that consistently has the highest levels of ozone in the region. Elevated levels of ozone cause serious health problems for everyone, but especially for those with lung disease. On August 16th of this year, during a period of elevated ozone levels in West Fort Collins, my neighbor, who had COPD, was found unconscious on her kitchen floor. Her husband administered CPR, but was unable to revive her, and she passed away. It is impossible to determine whether the o elevated ozone levels caused her death on that day, but we know that statistically speaking, high ozone levels elevate the death rate of people with compromised lung function. The bottom line is that oil and gas drilling is literally killing people in our community. For this reason and because of the looming co climate catastrophe, I oppose all oil and gas drilling in the county. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Uh, Gayla Martinez. Good morning. Good morning. Welcome. My name is Gayla Maxwell Martinez, and I would like to speak to you this morning about elephants, cows, and moths. Last Wednesday, I attended the oil and gas task force meeting. I couldn't help but notice that there were several large elephants in the room those unacknowledged facts that no one wants to mention, but that are at the heart of the matter. The first elephant is the unquestioned assumption that we must find a way to fit oil and gas development into an increasingly densely urbanized corridor. It's like a farmer who sells his farm, moves into the city, and insists on bringing his favorite cow to live with him in his new high-rise apartment. Cows, even the sacred cow of oil and gas extraction, have no place in urban areas. The second elephant is the assumption that this particular industry should not be required to fully pay its own way. If the cost of methane capture, of 24-7 air quality monitoring, or of post-production cleanup are too high, especially, for instance, for a smaller operator, then exceptions to the rules should be made. This is not true capitalism. Thirdly, we seem to be willing to set aside the state mandate to protect public health, safety, and the environment by over-focusing on the gray areas of the increasing scientific evidence that shows that close proximity to oil and gas production is a serious and significant health risk and that it is fouling our environment. The burden of proof is on the industry to show beyond a shadow of a doubt that oil and gas extraction does no harm and that evidence does not exist. The fourth ele elephant, perhaps the biggest, is climate change. On this question, the science is clear and unequivocal. Our entire planet is in grave danger. 
fossil fuel extraction and consumption is a major contributor to this crisis. We should be making every effort to curtail this activity as quickly as possible. Instead, we are like moths clustering around a porch light on a warm summer's night. We're so attracted to the shining promise of big bank accounts and increasing tax revenues that we, as a society, are oblivious to the destruction we bring upon ourselves. Will we make the necessary changes or will we continue to beat ourselves to death against a deceptive attraction? Thank you. For Very that. clever. Nice job. All right. Is there anyone else in attendance this morning that would like to make public comment? Seeing none, we'll close public comment. Thanks, everybody, for coming out. And we will move on to approval of the minutes for the week of September 23, 2019. John. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. I move to approve the minutes for the week of September 23, 2019. Very good. We have a motion. All those in favor signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3 0. Brenda Jemison, the business operations manager for the commissioner's office, is here. She's coming. She's going to review the draft schedule for the week of October 7, 2019. Hi, Brenda. Good morning, Commissioner. So on Monday, October 7th at 8 a.m., Commissioner Johnson will attend the Behavioral Health Policy Council meeting in the hearing room on the first floor. Nice. At 10 a.m., you have a work session regarding the Office of Emergency Management Mitigation Update. At 11 a.m., you have an executive session for a discussion regarding the NIST project. At 12 p.m., Commissioner Johnson will host his Meatloaf Monday meeting at the Trailhead Tavern wow. here in Fort Collins. Nice. At 1.30 p.m., you have a work session with Lori Cadridge, the Interim Director of Community Planning, Infrastructure, and Resources. At 3 p.m. and again at 6.30 p.m., you have the land use items with the development review team. That's in the hearing room on the first floor. On Tuesday, October 8th at 7.30 a.m., Commissioner Donnelly will attend the Biz West CEO Roundtable on Transportation at the Elevations Credit Union in Windsor. At 9 a.m., you have Administrative Matters. That's this meeting here in this room. At 1.30 p.m., you have Administrative Direction to the County Management. That's in the Sprague Lake Conference Room here on the second floor. On Wednesday, October 9th at 7.45 a.m., Commissioner Johnson and Kafalos may attend the Workforce Development Board meeting in the hearing room on the first floor. At 12.15 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos will speak at the City of Fort Collins Senior Advisory Board meeting at the Fort Collins Senior Center in Fort Collins. At 6 p.m., you have the Planning Commission County Commissioner Joint Work Session. That's in the hearing room on the first floor. On Thursday, October 10th at 7.30 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Fort Collins Downtown Development Authority Board meeting at the Rocky Mountain Innisfere here in Fort Collins. At 11.30 a.m., Commissioner Johnson may attend the Larimer County Interagency Oversight Group meeting at the Lake Loveland Conference Room on the second floor. 12 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Juvenile Community Review Board meeting at 255, 2555 Midpoint Drive in Fort Collins. At 1 p.m., Commissioner Donnelly will attend the Water in the West Tour at Larimer County's Little Thompson Farm on South Highway 287 in Berthoud. At 1.30 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Office on Aging Advisory Council meeting in Fort, on Midpoint Drive in Fort Collins. At 3 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Northern Colorado Legislative Alliance Healthcare Working Group at the Exchange Desk Chair Workspace in Loveland. 6 p.m., Commissioner Johnson may attend the Board of Health meeting. That's in the Carter Lake Conference Room on the first floor. At 6 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Colorado Department of Human Services Office on Early Childhood Stakeholder meeting at 800 South Taft in Loveland. On Friday, October 11th at 10 a.m., Commissioner Johnson will attend the Colorado County's Legislative Committee business meeting at the Colorado County's in Denver. At 11.30 a.m., Commissioner Don Lee and Kafalos may attend the Group Publishing Community Service Awards luncheon. That's at the Hilton here in Fort Collins. At 12.30 p.m., Commissioner Don Lee may attend the I-25 Funding Committee meeting at the Candlelight Dinner Playhouse in Johnstown. At 3 p.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Hearts and Horses Community Open House at the Hearts and Horses Therapeutic Riding Center in Loveland. On Saturday, October 12th at 9 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos will host a community conversation at Mio Mai Coffee and Pie in the Port. At 11 a.m., Commissioner Kafalos may attend the Harvest Farm Fall Festival at 4240 East County Road 66 in Wellington. That would be all for the week. Great. Any questions, comments? Corrections, John. Uh, yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. I just wish to respectfully correct the uh, October 12th uh, Mio Mai um, uh, 
is actually from 8.30 to 10 a.m. Oh, We've decided to change the time to accommodate the, the people who attend. 8.30 to 10, that would be the future times for the Laporte uh, community conversations. Thank you, okay. Brenda. Okay, thank you. And what are you going to talk about this coming week? The state of the county, the state of Colorado, the state of the world. Wow. Big. <laughs> That's going to be a, they might need a couple more hours, I guess. Well, you solve all the problems, let us know what, how it turns out. You'll okay. be the first one I would let know. Very good. All right, consent agenda this morning. Um, recommended approval of an abatement. Um, a number of agreements, nine agreements, uh, three deeds, uh, four resolutions, three miscellaneous items, and two liquor license issuances. Would either of my colleagues on the board like to remove any of these items from the consent agenda for additional information? Mr. Johnson. I would not. Mr. Falls. No, Mr. Chair. All right, Mr. Johnson, I look for a motion. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move approval of consent agenda for October 1st, 2019. Very good. We have a motion. All those in favor signify with an aye. 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 That motion is passed 3 0. Commissioner Kapalis and Commissioner Johnson, apparently you have guests this morning. We do. Okay, who would like to introduce the guests and ask them to come to the table? You. Come on up, whoever the guests are. We've had are a, a number of conversations with uh, uh, several folks, Tad Smith, Tanya Hadley, um, and uh, I think they came to uh, one of our uh, was it the Environmental Stewardship Awards meeting. That, so we had one of the presentations uh, at. If I may, um, <laughs> at least some of the Why folks. Do this to start with. Uh, uh, they've been working on this. They'll, they'll speak to that. But they attended. Well, some of the folks attended one of your Meatloaf Monday That's right. uh, conversations. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, I, I hope. So had the kids come with their models was what I was trying to say. I hope, was the food, I hope the food was good. The conversation <laughs> maybe was not. <laughs> so would you like to introduce your guests? Turn the other way around. Or ask them to introduce themselves? Sure. Go ahead, please. Sure. Welcome. Thanks for being here. Thanks for having us. Uh, I'm not sure which way it, that looks like it's Red on. light. Great. Red light good. So I'm. Here, not there. You, uh, we had a presentation, but we can also just talk. Oh, I see. Fun, That's too. what you're waiting on. I got gotcha. you. Before we get started, I noticed on the agenda, I think we've been told that we were going to present for 15 minutes. I noticed on the agenda it would look like we were scheduled for five, so um, what should we plan for today? Let's do ten. Ten. Let's split the difference. How about that? Okay, great. All right, good. So I'm Tad Smith, one of the leaders of the Northern Colorado Chapter of the American Tiny House Association, and I've got a couple of my colleagues with me here today. Um, and we're here to talk about uh, creating a framework for living legally in tiny houses on wheels in Larimer County. I appreciate the time you guys have given us today. Um, so we had some sections on you know, technical zoning issues and building code, and we might cut back on those a little bit today, just given the time, and nobody wants to hear that stuff anyway, right? Um, so, but I do want to give you a little bit of context before we get started on um, you know, what a tiny house is uh, and the people that want to live in a tiny house. So a tiny house on wheels, um, just to give you a little bit of context, is a house that's built with standard residential housing construction materials, but built on a chassis with wheels and designed to be movable. Uh, they're typically 20 to 30 feet long, about 200 to 300 square feet of interior living space, and usually have a single person living in it, or maybe a couple living inside of it. Um, so tiny houses on wheels, you may have seen on TV or on the internet somewhere, it's a relatively recent phenomenon. Why these things have been ga gaining in popularity? Well, I'm sure as everybody in this room knows, housing costs over the last 10 years in northern Colorado, but frankly nationwide, have great, the growth of housing costs have greatly outstripped wage growth. And so tiny houses on wheels represent a private sector response to that phenomenon, which is to say that you know, despite the high visibility Instagram accounts, most people that want to live in a tiny house actually just want to settle down and not tow their house all around the country, but just be able to buy their own first house. And a tiny house, in a lot of cases, represents their best opportunity to do so. They can afford to build a small house that meets their needs, but they can't afford to buy land in today's market. So the private sector solution that's arisen has been to build a small house and then to pay rent and utilities to a landowner in exchange for being able to live on their land in that tiny house uh, that could be movable by a later date. Um, rather than continue to drone on about this in abstract terms, I'm going to ask my friend Charlie Stevens that came with me today to talk a little bit about his situation living and working in Larimer County. Charlie? Thank you, Tad. Welcome. Thank you. My name is Charlie Stevens, as Tad mentioned. I'm from New Haven, Connecticut, where I was homeschooled. I worked my way through school out here at the University of Northern Colorado. I was able to graduate without any student debt, which I think is kind of amazing. Um, I'm currently teaching 7th and 8th grade English at the Colorado Early Colleges, Fort Collins. I also teach music lessons at Spotlight Music, and I'm the worship leader at a Lutheran church. 
As you know, the median home sales price in Fort Collins is now $450,000. Even with three jobs, I cannot afford to own my own home and I am stuck renting. The mortgage payment on a $450,000 house would be 80% of my combined income um, before taxes across the three jobs. Even the mortgage payment on a $250,000 home, if I would be able to find one, would be 50% of my income. All of this assumes I have tens of thousands of dollars for a down payment, which I do not. My teaching skills are in demand, and I expect that demand to increase as the population of Fort Collins continues to grow. I would like to put down roots and continue offering my time and talents to the community, but if I'm not able to uh, afford a reasonably priced house here, I might be forced to move elsewhere. Thanks, Charlie. So I had a big section here to talk for three or four minutes on building code and go through a bunch of details on tiny houses, but we'll, we'll skip that part today. I think at a high level, I, what I'd like to say is that the industry uh, that builds tiny houses, including builders here in Fort Collins as well as in Loveland and throughout the Front Range, has invested considerable time and effort in bringing conventional building standards to a structure that can be built on wheels. Um, Officials in Lyons and Fresno, San Luis Obispo, and other places um, have gone through this comprehensive code in detail and determined that tiny houses on wheels, in fact, can be safe as full-time dwellings. And I'm confident that if Larimer County were to consider legalizing tiny homes as full-time dwellings, that after going through the tiny house code in detail, that Larimer County building officials would come to the same conclusion as well. We could certainly answer any questions that you'd like to after the presentation about tiny house building code and how they are built. Uh, but for now, just given the time limitations, I think that we'll, uh, we'll breeze over this part a little bit. Um, so something more interesting, how do we actually envision tiny houses on wheels fitting into Larimer County? Uh, and a number of potential use cases come to mind. Uh, two that I'd like to use our time to highlight today would be a multi-generational living situation as well as small family farms. A uh, multi-generational living situation could take many forms, uh, but I'll just give you a couple ideas today as food for thought. Um, so take, for example, an elderly person in the primary house on a piece of property that maybe could use some level of income, maybe some help around the house, or maybe even some level of care. And someone living in a tiny house on their property, behind their house, or elsewhere on their property could put provide some or all of those needs of the elderly person in the primary house. That, such, that scenario could also be in reverse. So you could have an elderly person in a tiny house on wheels that raised a family in a larger house and now has sold that house in order to accommodate a smaller budget in their later years, but needs somewhere to put that tiny house on wheels on someone else's property. Um, likewise, take a working couple, for example, in a primary house on a piece of property. Uh, maybe could use some income to help cover their mortgage, maybe could use some help around the house, uh, perhaps could use some child care. And some or all of those needs could potentially be met by someone living on a tiny house, living in a tiny house on wheels on their property. Um, so the second kind of high-level example that we'd give is a small family farm in Larimer County. There's some thematic overlap between this and the multi-generational uh, living situation use case, insofar as at least the national average age of farmers in the United States is 58 years old. Um, a lot of those people are having to start to look, work a little bit less on the farm. But they've still got a farm that they need to be able to run and could use a little bit of help around the farm just keeping it going. Um, so, you know, and that could be, that help could potentially be provided by someone living on their property in a tiny house. Likewise, they could probably use a little bit of income to pay the property taxes because farm valuations have gone up so much in the last couple decades and as they're looking to retire, they're still responsible for the full property taxes on their farm. Again, income from someone paying them rent to put a tiny house on their property to also be able to help on the farm could potentially help offset that. Um, so I'm going to ask now uh, a colleague of my Tanya Andreas, to talk a little bit about her family farm situation uh, in Larimer County. Thank you. Hello. Good morning. Um, I'm Tanya Andreas. Thank you for having us. Um, I'm single, semi-retired. I have three acres with an old small farmhouse on it. I take care of about 50 animals on my homestead farm, poultry, sheep, llamas, dogs, and cats, which of course require daily care. I also have a large market garden that's managed by a farmer, but I'm responsible for daily watering. And I need occasional help, um, certainly extra income, and farm sitting. Um, I have not been off my property for more than two nights, well, other than two nights for a required conference for um, continuing ed for my licensure um, in the last four plus years. Um, it's just almost impossible to get somebody to come in and take care of the animals. Um, also, I had a back surgery a few years ago, and not being able to lift over 10 pounds for six weeks, how do you do that? So. 
um, for those reasons, um, and because I have a small property that would be a lovely place for people to live, um, and I can provide child care, pet sitting, and a very quality lifestyle, um, and my house really is too small and busy to share with a roommate situation, but I could definitely use the extra income. And because of the development pressure around my property, um, it makes no sense to try to build a, an accessory dwelling unit on a foundation. Um, a tiny house on wheels feels like a perfect situation for me and frankly many folks I know in a similar situation kind of providing a win-win for everyone. Thank you. Can you tell me approximately where you live? What, what I live um, northeast Fort Collins area, two miles west of Budweiser. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. So thanks, Tanya. In the time that we have left today, just I think we want to give a little bit of uh, color around some of the other ideas that we had around creating a framework for living legally in tiny houses in, uh, in, in Larimer County and how that would work. Um, and some of the considerations that the commissioners might have, I would expect first and foremost that, you know, one of the biggest concerns around tiny houses is that they fit, or any house for that matter, is that they fit the character of the area that they're being put in from a zoning perspective. Um, and tiny houses on wheels um, typically, you know, do look like a house. Other jurisdictions that have legalized tiny houses on wheels have made sure to ensure this by putting certain standards in with the permitting process to ensure that the appearance of the tiny house is like an actual house. So for example, standard residential siding, not fiberglass like an RV or a mobile home. You know, a minimum pitched roof of 312 or greater, again, not a flat roof like an RV or a mobile home. And probably most importantly, screening the wheels from view um, so that once the tiny house is in place, that it really does just look like a cute little house. Um, there's, you know, other things we could talk about here as far as the technical details. We would expect a tiny house on wheels to be considered an accessory dwelling unit, and there, there would be a limitation of one, maximum one per property where they would put. Um, and we, of course, expect all setbacks and other rules associated with, you know, houses would apply to tiny houses on wheels as well. Um, on the technical side, we'd recommend doing a five-year extendable permit for tiny houses on wheels. And although 95% plus of tiny houses on wheels don't get moved with any particular, within any particular calendar year, we'd expect a t five to ten year time horizon uh, would be typical kind of for a use case for putting a tiny house on wheels on someone else's property. Um, you know, we'd recommend capping the number of permits in Larimer County at 100 to start out. And in doing so, you know, that would mean that even have adding 100, you know, tiny houses on wheels to a 2,600 square mile land area would be a de minimis impact on density within the county. Um, and, you know, at, finally, as, you know, as a single family home, uh, we would expect, you know, the review process that would apply to a tiny house on wheels would be pretty similar to what would be a typical house. So the public site plan review process, as I'm familiar with it at least, um, that applies to any, you know, house that's built within the county. Um, just to wrap it all up, um, you know, we're here today because tiny houses on wheels can be safe to live in, and people that want to live in tiny houses in Larimer County need a legal opportunity to be able to do that. Um, legalizing tiny houses on wheels in Larimer County would be a win for the county under both the comp plan and the strategic plan. For the comp plan specifically, principle two of the housing section of the comp plan uh, mandates that the county support a variety of housing stock for the various needs of its constituents, and actually mentions tiny houses on wheels by name. Um, as a candidate for future support by the county. Um, under the strategic plan, under John's section, goal two, um, mandates the county to work on reducing the housing overburden ratio for people that are overburdened by housing cost, and certainly allowing people to live in a smaller, more cost-effective housing form would help contribute to that goal, objective four under goal two. Um, so finally, you know, I think I speak for everybody in this room, public servants and citizens alike, in saying that I think everybody's preference would be that the county encourage private sector innovation and solutions to help combat, you know, rising housing costs. And, um, you know, rather than having government shoulder the burden directly of defraying cost of housing for its own citizens. And I, I certainly, you know, certainly think that tiny houses on wheels are one of the best private sector solutions that have come up in the last few years to address housing costs here as well as nationwide. So I want to thank you again for your time today. We'd be happy to discuss further answer any questions for you. Do we have any questions for these folks? They're very comprehensive. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and thank you, uh, Tad and colleagues, for presenting uh, a couple of questions that I have. Um, first of all, I'm curious, what is the state uh, in Lamar County, what is the, the status of, of uh, companies that are actually manufacturing uh, tiny homes in the county or, or perhaps in the region? Sure. I'm aware of a couple of manufacturers off the top of my head. And again, these people are 
manufacturing tiny houses on wheels, not necessarily for living in Larimer County. I know, for example, Mitch Craft uh, up on 287 builds some of the most beautiful tiny houses you'll see anywhere and ships them all over the country. Mm -hmm. um, I think those tiny houses retail for a lot higher than kind of the typical use case that we'd be talking about. Um, but he definitely builds beautiful work. Um, and um, there's another one uh, in Lo based in Loveland called um, uh, LC Carpentry that builds tiny houses as well. And that's Luke Camps. And so there is a, uh, especially if we can expand the market for uh, tiny homes regionally, there is the potential for a positive economic impact. Is that correct? Yeah, ab absolutely. I mean, there's not, it's not just Larimer County. I mean, I would call the front range um, one of the epicenters of, I think because the tiny house movement more or less started with a company based in Colorado Springs, I think the front range as far as the industry goes has a head start. I mean, for example, in Denver, the leading manufacturer worldwide of the chassis that tiny houses on wheels are built in, uh, built on trailer made is based in Denver and ships them all over the world. Um, so absolutely, you know, as far as the industry goes, I think the front range is a center of activity for what's going on and giving people a chance to live legally here in them would only boost that economically. Thank you, Ted. May yeah. I continue with a couple more questions, Mr. Chair? Yeah. Go ahead, John. Okay. <laughs> We're looking at the tiny, tiny, whatever you called it, Mitchcraft. Oh, yeah. Website, right? Yeah, there's some beautiful pictures on there. And I would I add. Some of the homes behind the fence as you go up 287. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I would add that Mitchcraft would welcome you all to visit the homes. I think seeing them says almost more than we can. They're really very well done. Uh, so it, with permission, I, I just have a couple more questions, and I appreciate um, your, your being here. One is, what are some examples of uh, best practices in terms of matching um, the folks who purchase, may purchase a tiny home mm -hmm. and where they wish to locate that tiny home, assuming we could figure out the land use code issues and all of that? I think there's a couple ways to accomplish that. I mean, of course, there's, you know, just going out and potentially knocking on people's doors or whatever and randomly finding someone that might want to host a tiny house. I think maybe a more effective way, there's a couple organizations around the county that I think would be very good at that. One would be an organization called Neighbor to Neighbor. Now, I haven't had discussions with them yet, uh, but Neighbor to Neighbor takes, you know, like we talked about earlier, an elderly person perhaps living in a large house by themselves. I believe that's called the Home Share Program. Exactly, that has space and and finds people and vets people that would be a good fit for that elderly person to live in their house, help them out, and pay them some rent. I think I would expect the neighbor and neighbor will be pretty well positioned to do an analogous thing uh, with small family farms, for example. Um, but there's also, of course, farmers groups. I know Tanya met with one the other day, actually, in the past week or so, Larry and there was a lot. Farmers Alliance. And Tanya mentioned that, you know, when she mentioned the idea to them, uh, that, that she had a got lot of great feedback, actually, on people that might be interested in something like this. Thank you. My last question, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, is, is um, what do you folks see as the next steps? It is my understanding that in some ways you've been interfacing with our, our um, um, building uh, department as well as our planners, and you've come up with some specific uh, recommendations, language perhaps regarding building code and land use code. What do you see as the next steps uh, in terms of actually coming up with language uh, text that that potentially we you know we could uh, uh, consider and and the planning commission consider as we look to update our land use code and our building codes uh, to accommodate uh, this type of um, housing sure uh, y y we did have a chance earlier this year and appreciate the opportunity to sit down uh, with Matt Lafferty and with Eric Freed and talk a little bit about tiny houses and just you know, gauge their interest a little bit and the feedback that we got in that meeting was that um, you know that they are uh, interested in the idea, certainly aware of what's going on uh, generally with tiny houses, um, but of course our, you know, like everybody else working in the county are very busy, and so we were encouraged to have the commissioners recommend um, to, I believe, to Leslie uh, to request this be uh, an item uh, for them to allocate staff time and resources to, to work on, you know, exploring how to get this done. And certainly we've been involved ourselves with processes in other municipalities and could lend some guidance on, you know, what was done there as far as their process. Thank you. Uh question for my commissioner colleagues. Um, one, one idea was that from this presentation uh, that maybe we could, uh, if you think there's value to that, have some kind of a work session where we could get into more details and then based on that work session we could make a more informed decision about the request that I'm hearing here and that is, you know, do we um, allocate resources to actually look at the nuts and bolts of 
uh, you know, fig figuring out the building code and the land use code, do you, do you think there would be value in having a work session, a half hour devoted to this or something? I think there would be value in it. I'm wondering if it would be better to do it in one of our joint meetings with the Planning Commission, maybe invite some people from the Agricultural Advisory Board. I would rather do that. I'd rather have their land use experience and input. That's just my suggestion, but I think either one would be good. Okay. Well, and I think there's specific issues. Um, even on this website, these are nice-looking homes, but you can see in the pictures they're powering them by extension cords run along the ground. Absolutely, that, yeah. That can't work. You, uh, you, you, have to have a, you have to have a sewer hookup. You have to have a, a real electrical hookup. You, you have to invest real money. And, the, and, and frankly, um, housing costs are high in this county, but, but even probably m maybe even more expensive are land costs. And, and one thing in the county that would make this more challenging is the fact that you have to be able to accommodate a septic tank or a septic system on, a, on, a, uh, on any property. So you've got, a, a right off the bat, you've got almost a two and a half acre lot size minimum just to put a tiny house on there. So um, at, at some point, it, it, it makes the economics of the, of the deal a little less tenable, I think, frankly. And so I don't, I don't, I'm not asking for a response. I'm just telling you, I think that's that's some of your challenges. Sure. I mean, that, those are some of your challenges. And so those will have to be solved, and they're not going to be solved by us sitting around singing kumbaya. I mean, we need we need uh, our staff to, to come up with specific recommendations. Right, Matt? You've worked, uh, looked at this stuff, and you've worked on it a little bit. Um, and, and, we, and the county has tried to, um, to make, uh, you know, accessory dwelling units and things like that more affordable. I go to dairy farms fairly regularly and see the real challenge that they have as far as housing their employees. And we don't make it easy for them. We don't make it easy for them at all. And, um, and those guys, you know, when you're milking 400 cows a day, three times a day, there's no, yeah, they're just like you. There's no vacations. There's nothing because you, you have to make sure you got people there all the time. And so, yeah, those are real, those are real actual challenges in this county and they do need um, solutions. And so I, I don't know, I mean, I don't know if the wheels are, I mean, I don't know what the wheels have to do with any of this, but I mean, yeah, yeah if you wanted to, if you wanted to accommodate um, smaller homes on properties as a means for people to, for farm labor, for uh, affordability issues and things like that, I think that's, well, I don't think we have any problem with that. But I mean, this idea of the wheels kind of sounds like you just want to, pull it out and dump the septic tank on the ground somewhere and then pull it back in. Most, and I know you're yeah. not trying to suggest well, that, but I mean, yeah. that's a challenge. Right? I think the wheels just to jump in for 10 seconds. I'm just saying the worst, the worst case scenario or yeah. the very worst operator is who we make regulations for, right? right. Or we try to, you yeah. know what I mean? You understand. Yeah. Mr. Yeah. Chair, John. just a, a final comment on my part and maybe to um, respond to Commissioner Johnson's suggestion. First of all, you, you raise valid points. I mean, there's no question about it. Uh, but it, it is my understanding that these folks have done a lot of homework and research, and they, they can provide examples of how other uh, communities, whether in Colorado or in, this, in the nation, have, have solved these issues of you know, sept, making sure septic systems were proper, making sure we're not just running extension cords uh, you know, to get electricity. So I, I think uh, it merits a further a discussion, deeper discussion, and I think Commissioner Johnson was suggesting that maybe this is uh, something we could schedule for um, uh, a, a, a planning committee, joint planning commission, and, and maybe invite, for example, um, not just uh, people from the, the Ag Advisory um, uh, Board, but also from the uh, um, Aging Advisory Council, uh, because we're talking about multi-generational, and we're talking about um, helping to address some of the uh, uh, needs on, of farmers, and it's not just small farmers. It's, mm -hmm. I mean, uh, dairy farms. Far, actually, you know, farm labor is a big issue, and housing is a big, big issue, and this might be one way to, you know, try to address some of that. So why don't I make a recommendation? Then Matt, Matt came down. Matt, why don't you um, see how we look on our calendar for upcoming meetings with our planning commission? You can talk to the board and find out what our recommendations are for folks that should be involved, and if you can, if you have. I know you're tough. You're working on a lot of stuff upstairs, Leslie. Is you know, cell cell phone regulations, oil and gas, uh, the the Cestus Park land use, and the, and actually the rewrite of the county's land use code. Um, I don't know if you guys have time, but you'll have to let us know if you have time to really 
um, look at what other counties have done, research that, develop potential code language. I, I don't know. I mean, maybe you're pushed out six months, and I, or something like that. But you need to you need to look at it and honest give us an honest evaluation of, of how much time you have because I know you're doing you're working on a lot of stuff. Now maybe at the by the end of this year, some of that stuff will hopefully be off the plate. But and but you, I think you should do that. And it seems to me that that these folks have done a lot of that research. And to me, this is an opportunity. Uh, to try to help the planning folks and create a, a collaborative opportunity to learn from what they've, you know, what they've gotten presented to our planning people. You can verify the facts, and, and might, that might help deal with some of your workload issues. I just had one other question I wanted to ask you. What what is the level of neighborhood opposition? There's always the NIMBY thing when you try to do anything in a neighborhood. You know, there's neighbors that don't like it. They're going to imagine the worst. They don't know what the things look like. Has, what's been your experience or knowledge of other communities, how they've dealt with the neighborhood concerns? I, I will say, you know, given that it's not, um, you know, virtually anywhere in the United States, there are pockets of places where it is legal to live in a tiny home, but because of the, uh, there's an extended process for getting this done on a municipal level, um, there's plenty of places in the United States where it's not legal to have a tiny house. And uh, being very involved with the tiny house world and myself, I know that kind of the standard operating procedure uh, if you find someone that's interested in potentially having a tiny house on their land, albeit illegally in a lot of places, um, is to approach the neighbors in advance to ask them because, of course, zoning and virtually everywhere is enforced on a complaint-based system. Um, based on, you know, I'm in, I'm in <laughs> sorry to bring up social media here, but I'm in Facebook groups that have like, you know, 100,000 people in them uh, that post about tiny house-related issues. And I've seen very, very few examples uh, just taking that as my source information, probably the best source information out there. I've seen, you know, almost no examples of people being asked to remove their hot tiny house um, from those properties, which of course would be driven, I'm connecting this back to your question because that would be driven by a complaint by one of their neighbors. Um, so while there is, I think at a high level there could be opposition in abstract theoretical terms, uh, I think in the real world practice so far we have just haven't seen a lot. Uh, well, with our public site process, we wouldn't I think what you're describing is situations where people do it and then ask for forgiveness later. The public site process is plan process is asking for permission first, so you would notify the neighbors and. Well, and I think what I was describing was a little bit analogous to what you're doing formally through a public site process in terms of notifying all the neighbors in the vicinity right. and then asking yeah. for a public comment. I think what people in the tiny house community have done where it's not necessarily legal yet on a zoning basis is kind of take that process into their own hands and go knock on the doors of neighbors and just ask their opinion in advance. Um, so let's, okay, okay. Linda. Interesting. I, I think it because Colorado has unique water laws. Yeah. Um, I think challenging. the examples from Colorado where other uh, jurisdictions have solved the problem of shared water supply or uh, maybe shared septic or something because that's fairly tightly regulated in Colorado, maybe more so than in other states. So those examples would be particularly helpful. Um, and I don't know exactly what all the regulations are around those, but I don't think that they're local. I yeah. think they're predominantly yeah, they're, state they're regulations. State. And, the, and the other thing is that for, to, for Commissioner Johnson, um, you do have uh, some experience with this, although not tiny homes on wheels. Whenever we have an application in this county for someone to build an ADU, almost every time the neighbors come out and they say, what's their concern? Mm -hmm. Yeah. They're going to rent, rent this, yeah. and actually, what you're advocating is actually rental of an of an ADU. That's actually what you're coming here to ask for. It, it's so, not a hundred. Hold sure. on. Yeah. Now wait a minute. You can yeah. run for office. You can do that. <laughs> and so, and I encourage it. Please do. Uh, yeah. Uh, but but we've we've long history of not allowing these things to be rented, and and I guarantee you, people come out of the woodwork whenever. Uh, there's an ADU application saying well, these things are going to be rented and it's going to just be you're doubling the density in my neighborhood and in my streets aren't made for that and all, I mean I, all the issues you know you know what I'm talking about but that's but so essentially that's what you've come in today and asked us to do and so I mean I think that that that, just, that demands a much broader process and and much more engagement particularly with our planning staff because. If you think that we've experienced it, they've really experienced it over the years. And there's a lot of time that we've uh, that we've invested in our development of our regulations. And and frankly, um, and it's we still have a lot of controversy. And we always approve those things. I'm not saying we we don't we don't like the use. 
We do. I mean, or, or I think almost always. I guess there was one case where we, I remember where we did not um, recently. Uh, but uh, but that's it's a controversial use. I mean, make no mistake. I mean, there's a people understand. I mean, I think that people understand the issues with housing affordability. But when it comes right down to it, I think um, having rental rental units on on you know single family or subdivision lots and things like that has been controversial. It has definitely been controversial over the years. Okay, we got to move on though. You want to make some final, you want to rebut me? No, I just okay. want to validate what you've said and what everyone has said. Oh, okay. And, and frankly, I, you know, being on this job for nine months, I haven't seen very few things that aren't controversial. <laughs> none of this, none of this <laughs> stuff, it, it none fun. of this stuff is yeah. easy. None of this stuff is easy, but it if we want to. was sailing before you got here, man. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's because um, we'll leave it at that. Thank you all for being here. Thank you so much for the time today. I really Thanks appreciate it. We appreciate you coming in, and we appreciate your uh, research. It was, it's very well done. Thanks a lot. Okay. Um, and speaking of, uh, you know, uh, extension cord drone across the ground, Chris. although not exactly the instance here, uh, we're going to talk about the, the cost estimate to uh, fight the McNay fire. And uh, Captain Loberg, if you're here. Thank you. For, for Justin Weitzel, here. our emergency operations manager, is with us. Hi, Justin. You got rain today. Got rain today. Oh, that's that's nice. why you can come in. That's, that's the only reason you can come in. Comfortable coming in, talking to that's you. That's a blessing. Thank you, sir. He's got time to kill. No fire restrictions. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, uh, you have some bad news for us or good news? Uh, well, it depends on how you want to look at it. So, uh, well, that's full kind of guys. That's bad. Yeah, we wanted to come and present you with uh, the cost estimates. And again, these are just estimates. They probably will fluctuate anywhere from 5 to 8 percent. Justin, why don't you introduce yourself? Uh, Justin Weitzel, Emergency Operations Director for the Larimer County Sheriff's captain. Office. Mike Lober, Captain, Larimer County Sheriff's Office. Thanks, guys. Um, so, what you have in front of you is just the, uh, the first page is what the uh, fire cost summary is, the estimated cost for the total fire. Um, from aviation, the hand crews, camp support, and then other folks that were on the fire. Uh, and you see the total cost right now estimated is 483000 so just under 500000 I think originally we were saying around a million. Um, we were able to reduce a lot of the aviation resources after the first day, and we used a lot of uh, personnel from our, our unit to try and minimize some of those costs. So we had five people from emergency services that were tied into the fire. Uh, to try and help offset some of those costs as well. And then on the second page is just a graph of kind of the, the split of what those costs were for. Uh, the third page is the county estimate, so what the county is looking at paying. So out of that 483000 we're right now sitting around 245000 that uh, is the county responsibility at this point. And, and just to touch on that real quick, DFPC, Defense of Fire prevention and control absorbed all of the day one uh, costs for the air support, so it was a significant um, help with this fire. And how, and how many um, how many individuals did we have working the fire lines? How many at one at the firefighters? At the highest, it was 100 over a little bit over 120 personnel on the fire, and on the first day we had 11 aircraft. Uh, obviously, if you haven't driven up 74E where the fire was, it was pretty close to Glacier View and. Uh, so we used a lot of the aircraft to try and minimize the chance, the potential for it getting into Glacier View. Obviously, if it would have got into the subdivision, it could have been pretty catastrophic. So uh, it could have been a whole different amount of money that we're sitting here talking about. So uh, we used a lot of aircraft to try and prevent that from happening. And then in addition to that DPC money that they paid for the aircraft, uh, there's also we have an intergovernmental agreement with the Division of Wildlife or Colorado Parks and Wildlife now, I always get confused, but um, we have an intergovernmental agreement with them where we can submit for every year they carry $89,500 that they'll pay to counties if the fire's on state land. Well, all 100% of this fire was on state land, so I'm trying to put together the invoices to submit that claim to Colorado Parks and Wildlife to hopefully get $89,500. I talked to uh, the state yesterday and they weren't aware of any other county submitting for that, so hopefully I can get that in quickly because it's first come, first serve kind of thing. So, uh, trying to process all our invoices. So, <laughs> anything you want to say, Captain? 
Uh, just one additional thing. Obviously, that first day that there were high um, aircraft costs, and I think a lot of that came from the pilots that were in the air basically saying, hey, we need additional help up here. And when I arrived up there on Sunday talking to Justin about that and seeing the proximity with the homes, um, it was just good collaboration and good information between the, the two of them and using some resources that really could help stop that fire. And Justin talked about the terrain up there, but it's pretty rocky, difficult terrain, and running up some of those valleys was a significant risk for us. So I'm happy with the collaboration and partnership between those groups and uh, you know, not losing any homes and, and no injuries on the fire line either. So I think it was a, a pretty well-fought fire. So. Yeah, that's really great work. And as uh, you know, Justin's f far too humble to admit it, but that, that had the potential to be a, a tremendous uh, disaster. And, uh, and the fact that our folks got on that thing so quick and, and got resources deployed and got, uh, we had all the firefighters from everywhere, I think, in here. I, do you have a list of all the departments that responded? Uh, we have a list with our public information officer. I don't have it in front of me, but we did have a, a lot of the local resources, and we even had to get firefighters from out of state just because of the size, and then yeah. crews weren't available, so we did get crews from Utah and Idaho, and uh, even a lot of the aircraft came from Utah, Idaho, California. So we were pulling in anything we could find. So, so it was really good work, fast fast response and you guys did uh, tremendous work we're really um, impressed and really proud of the of the job you did and I know everybody up there appreciates it a lot Thank you, yeah I drove up there someday to get firewood up at Red Feather and yeah, saw of course. it it's pretty amazing scavengers <laughs> come after the fire and I went to, uh, up by uh, the Kilpecker site they're doing a lot of firewood yeah. all those trees yeah. they cut down for the power line they're yeah. allowing the public to go in there and get firewood but I don't know anything about motor vehicle insurance, but I think I have property damage on my motor vehicle policy. Does that ever cover any anything mm -hmm. like this? If a motor vehicle causes structural damage to a building or a fire, is, is there any uh, ability to recover anything from a insurance policy if if there is coverage for that? Because this fire was started by a vehicle. Yeah. Is it a tire or what happened? Uh, they think the brakes were overheating from Denver, and then by the time they got to the hill there, they were hot enough that they were able to cause a fire in the vehicle and then it was they had a camper on the back a pickup truck with the camper on the back so obviously a lot of material to fan the fire and then there was some ammunition that firefighters had to back off because the rounds were being shot off so but I do believe that there is uh, we have gone after insurance companies on previous car fires the uh, big elk fire from I don't even remember when that was they all blend together but uh, similar <laughs> thing where it was a car fire uh, or started by a catalytic converter and then we did go after them for some uh, money for that. Is there well. plans to look into that for this fire? You know State Patrol is looking into the actual cause and the origin of the fire so we'll have to coordinate that with them. First, I, yeah. I think the next step would be obviously get with Jeff Green and try to figure out you know on a county perspective what does that look like okay. and having that insurance expert um, kind of dive into that but we'll be happy to look into that as well. Okay my other question is when I got back Sunday afternoon I saw that there was a fire three miles northwest of Red Feather Lakes. Do you know anything about that? What I didn't see any smoke when I got back. Uh, so there's been, there's been, there was a wildland fire. Uh, when was that? I can't remember. That'd be Sunday. Sunday. This was Sunday afternoon, Sunday. I believe. Yeah. So Probably Sunday right. afternoon, yeah, it was a wildland fire. We believe it was started by ashes being left out and then either people burning on top of it or uh, just uncareful with the winds. And, uh, uh, a quick response. Or no, it was at somebody's to, personal residence. That should be close to Crystal Lakes. So yeah, Crystal Lakes responded and was able to uh, deal with the fire. Red Feather came over and assisted, and then uh, one of our folks from the sheriff's office went up to tie in with them, and the U.S. Forest Service was there, but we used a single-engine air tanker and a helicopter on that one because uh, of the proximity to homes to try and knock it down. Luckily, that only got to 1.3 acres, mm -hmm. so it uh, wasn't too bad, and conditions weren't like they were for the McNay fire. But... Hopefully with this rain, we'll be in a little bit of a holding pattern to keep fires away for a little while. Yes, good, good news. Commissioner, go ahead. Uh, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And Justin and uh, Captain, um, I isn't it correct that this was, the McNay fire was a fast moving fire, perhaps going like three to five miles per hour? The flames weren't very high, but it was fast moving. And if that's the case, how does that affect how you fight this fire? 
Uh, yeah, this was definitely a fast moving fire. It was in the light, flashy fields, the grass, uh, and it was at the base of the hill there. So obviously when you got the slope and light, flashy fields, it'll carry pretty quickly. I don't know the exact speed, but um, when I called dispatch, I was told it was going up the hill and it was three quarters of the way up the hill. And by the time I got there, it was already over the hill. Mm. So it took me about a half hour to get there. But uh, it had already gone over the hill and was heading down the backside of it. So it moved rather quickly. And obviously, uh, the biggest thing is trying to get resources into it. And like as the captain alluded to, there wasn't a lot of road there. So we had to hike crews in and try and get people onto the fire as best we could. Uh, the aviation resources were called in because of the terrain and how fast it was moving. So obviously, we try and use the aviation resource with the ground resources we can't rely on one or the other so it's a it's a coordinated effort with everybody and um, just trying to get crews in when we're short crews trying to find them around the country it takes a couple days to get those folks in so um, when they're moving fast we try and get as many, many people onto it as we can so thank you great all right any other questions well thanks guys it's great to uh Good news. I mean, it really is good news and great work, Justin, and all your and all your folks that responded to that fire. It was great work. You joke around about it. You can't remember. You can't even remember. You keep them all straight anymore. But that, I mean, you've got. In fact, we're we're sorry for you because you like worry about fire all the time. You're always worried, um, but we're glad we got somebody like you. I mean, we're, you. We couldn't make it without you, man. So thanks a lot. Thank you. See you guys later. All right, Dalen Figs. Yeah, our natural resources director is here with a little slew of folks. We're going to talk about a, um, a flood parcel in the Big Thompson Canyon. Charlie, I think that my, somebody, that, I think that mic might not be that good. So, um, Justin, if you want to talk too much, you might share. You might have to share the mic with uh, Megan. So, um, so welcome everybody. Uh, we're going to talk about the purchase of the Weiss property in the the Big Thompson Canyon something the board's been briefed on a couple of times uh, last week the open lands advisory board uh, took action and provided a recommendation in support of this of this purchase um, dalen figs our natural resources directors here along with a slew of other folks so to begin why don't you introduce yourselves i will uh and thank you and good morning well i'm dalen figs i'm the natural resources director and with me is megan flanagan who is our Conservation Program Manager, Charlie Johnson, a senior land agent, and Justin Kaur, also a land agent. And we just want to talk briefly about the Weiss Tract. And what I've asked Megan to do initially is to really put this acquisition in context and talk a little bit about the work we're doing in the Big Thompson Canyon and why this track is important to us. And then Justin will go over the details of the acquisition itself. Very good. Hi, Megan. Hi, good morning. Um, I know you've heard a little bit from us in the past about our Big Thompson Conservation and Recreation Plan that we developed post-flood. And that plan identified of the four parks that Larimer County previously managed in the canyon that we would reopen uh, all four of them in a variety of ways. The Forks Park being the one with the uh, most developed public access. And so we partnered with CDOT uh, throughout the reconstruction of Highway 34 and worked with them on reconstructing a parking lot uh, based on some modeling to make sure it was out of the floodway and the floodplain. And uh, if you go up there today, you see our parking lot on site. Uh, it's about a 15 car parking lot. There's a vault toilet. Mm -hmm. And um, one of the key things in this area was um, really wanting to, as you can see on the map, Forks Park is the ownership of Forks Park came to the county after the 1976 flood. So it's a different array of parcels that are separate from each other and not as uh, contiguous as we'd ideally like it to be. And in particular, the Weiss parcel, which Justin will go into details with, is uh, adjacent and really in the center of the gap between what we'd like to be um, managing more holistically as Forks Park. So um, between our work with CDOT that Justin will describe a little bit and wanting to do go. some trades with them on right of way that we gave them throughout the flood process, but also acquiring the Weiss property and other in holdings within this region. Um, this is the first step towards Whoops. accomplishing that goal. Okay. Oh. oh, Linda, you made a mess it up now. Nice <laughs> job. 
All right, so just to kind of touch on the, I guess, the high points of the final review that we uh, discussed last week with OLAB and also it's in the uh, information that was provided to you is, uh, is what's on this slide here. And that's basically that we're looking at uh, a property that's about one third of an acre. Uh, the purchase price that we've negotiated with the landowner is $60,000. Um, there is a mobile home and some infrastructure on the property that the county will be removing upon acquiring the land. Uh, future development of the land is uh, unlikely, um, at least in portions of the property that are covered by the floodway delineation. Not all of the property is in the floodway, but a good portion of it is. Um, Megan kind of touched on the uh, potential for the acquisition of those nearby CDOT parcels to uh, provide some additional county ownership um, in this area and add to Forks Park. And again, just to kind of touch on uh, the, the key conservation values uh, for acquiring the property is that it adds more land uh, to the county ownership there, um, enhances the buffer to Forks Park and provide some opportunity or some additional land for public uh, recreation and access to the river. And I think um, as time goes by and this property um, kind of uh, recovers and uh, vegetation comes back in, there'll be some scenic value that's uh, provided by the acquisition of this land as well. So the recreation, are you talking fishing? Or it seems like with the trees, that'd be a good place for a picnic table. Right. Or something like that as well. What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that's something we can look at over time. Uh, this parcel, the Weiss parcel, is um, contiguous to the west of Forks Park and up on a bench. So it is outside of the floodway itself, and so it does have some potential that way. But it also provides, it's on the curve right after you've left Drake. And so the uh, screening that it provides to the trailhead and from the trailhead back is, is a pretty significant uh, feature. Also, by acquiring the property and removing a lot of the material that's on it will uh, open that up, that view shed, but also prevent the trailer, uh, a lot of debris and things like that from being a hazard in a future uh, flood situation as well. Megan and Justin, uh, regarding the debris and the demolition material from the uh, removal of the uh, mobile home and the concrete infrastructure, do we have the ability to divert some of that material from the landfill, or where will that stuff go? Um, well, I think that you know the the condition of that mobile home is in pretty bad shape. Um, it was impacted by the 2013 flood, and um, I don't think there's much opportunity to reuse that material. So it just goes in the dump, right? And there will be some asbestos mitigation associated with the trailer yeah, as well. Probably, so we'll it probably sure. actually won't go in the dump. Yeah, frankly. part of it will not for that purpose, yeah. It probably has to go to a line landfill. I don't know that, but it might, would be my guess. And our landfill is not lined to the cost. If we have concrete demolition and recovery up and, up and running by the time that's done, that could be salvaged. I know we're trying to keep concrete out of the landfill, yes. but that might be. Is it on a foundation? Is it actually on a concrete uh, foundation? I don't even, probably isn't even on one. The, the trailer is not, but there's a small retaining wall behind oh, the trailer. The garage, too. And it, yeah. Is it, is it cinder block, or what is it? Uh, the retaining wall is poured concrete. Okay. Yeah, and the, the garage, is it stick built, or is it? It's stick built on concrete. Okay. 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 Well, um, do you have your, where's your big picture? Where's your overall picture? that again there we go move it up a little bit zoom in a little don't listen to Linda what Linda tells you to do, do not, don't do what Linda tells you thank you there you go I'll give you permission okay so uh, I think it I think the thing that's really interesting about this is you can see the bounds of Forks Park it abuts that abuts National Forest right and then we also the county also has that piece of ground on the on the far left or the west side um, there's one small in in holding lot and then there's a C dot lot that the county prob will probably acquire at some point so you're getting to the point where you've got a, a pretty large um, potentially a, a pretty significant um, land holding there by the county that could make a really really nice enhancement as Commissioner Johnson mentioned there's all sorts of recreation that could occur there I mean that fishing access is unbelievable, frankly. I mean, that's so valuable, and you'll never have another chance to acquire it, probably. I mean, God forbid another 
a devastating catastrophic flood but I mean other than that I mean these things are so, th this opportunity comes so rarely I really think this is um, a great work by our county staff to, to, to bring this into the fold uh, you know it's a small I mean like you said it's only a third of an acre or something it's a really important third of an acre as far as our plans to to really provide a lot of great recreation in that big Thompson Canyon and a few years ago um, prior to, I think it was prior to the flood remember we were going through that master planning effort in the big Thompson Canyon and I, I was amazed because I thought it was going to be like fishing access and can you know canoeing or ca not ca kayaking stuff like that the, the number one thing people said is they want restroom facilities in the canyon <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and so there you go we're providing that again so um, this really this really checks a lot of boxes and it really and I re think it really demonstrates your you really your the function and the purpose of this department right we get we all get excited about the giant 10,000 acre ranch and those things are exciting and they're important too but this kind of stuff this you know small parcel acquisition decades to complete the the you know the purchases and bringing it all together is really important as far as being beneficial for our community and this is a great example of that and really really well done is thank you Dallas Miller built the handicap access facility that's up further it's further upstream yeah. further okay. west that's, yeah. that's, that's as i recall this, that did not get rebuilt did it no it has not been this, oh, it has it been it, it has, has been, been rebuilt, rebuilt. Oh, okay. Is it rebuilt? okay yes because i was thinking this is i think as i recall this is a fairly if not a huge cliff or no, it's not anymore. It looks a yeah. lot different it's now. It's pretty flat yeah. now. Yeah. yeah, we partnered with um, CDOT and the coalition on the restoration all through here and up around the curve towards um, Dallas's property. But the Waltonia area is where the fishing pier, handicapped fishing pier, is now located. Yeah. And is that, is, oh, John, go ahead. Mile marker 72, I believe. Oh, okay. And so is there is there any plan to do any kind of enhancements further enhancements on the river in this section segment um, we're monitoring it now you'll see uh, if you go up now there's a lot of um, growth from the last year's restoration work and we actually have a contract with the coalition to do all the weed control through our department so we're monitoring a certain level of um, shrub density and growth that we want to see but the river itself is intact some of the CPW uh, fishery Re, uh, where they've electroshocked and resampled is uh, showing the fisheries back at a level that they would expect. Okay. So, a lot so of you're it's. Not planning to go in and put rocks in the river, I mean, to, you know, habitat and things like that. That's already done. That's already done. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. yeah. We do plan to build a step staircase and a uh, river access trail still from the parking lot when before next spring. Great. Yeah. Well, I'm really excited about this. I'm going to be. Uh, proud to support this um, acquisition and so uh, any other questions nope. colleagues Commissioner Falls it's your turn uh, thanks mr. chair thank you uh, uh, DNR colleagues I move to approve the purchase of the 0.33 acre Weiss parcel for sixty thousand dollars very good we have a motion any further discussion seeing none all those in favor signify with an aye all right. aye that motion has passed three zero uh, thank you guys Good work. Thank you. Good work. Really mean it. Very good. All right. Pardon me. Did you yes? need, did you need to authorize someone to ha the authority to sign at the closing table? Do you need that now? We, we need it before that. closing. When's that going to occur? The next Thursday. Oh, so you better do it. You always have statement of authority. Don't we already oh. have always have that? Well, I've never heard of us doing that before, Linda. We do, but you do it on all of them. We do it through consent I think okay all right no. you put on consent next week yeah okay okay good all right all right I knew want to make sure <sighs> it's a well-oiled machine here <laughs> a lot of times the engineer doesn't know where the trains headed I think okay Ken Cooper's here our facilities director down the track and Jennifer hi Jennifer Jennifer Johnson our facilities planning and real estate group manager um, we're gonna have a little update on our uh, on progress of the redevelopment of our Larimer County shop facility in Estes Park. So uh, why, don't you, why don't you guys introduce yourselves for those who might be listening. Hi, I'm Jennifer Johnson, Facilities Real Estate Development Manager. Welcome. Cooper, Facilities Director. So who'd like to begin? Thank you. Yeah, go ahead. Thanks for your time this morning. Um, we can be brief. The uh, letter that's in front of you uh, spells out uh, the Park to replace the uh, fleet maintenance shop there. 
this primarily by Rose Bridge, um, also co uh, uh, located and used by, by the CDOT staff that uh, operate out of there. That's a long term arrangement uh, that we would like to continue and have worked with that group for uh, several years now, uh, trying to advance the project as a shared uh, uh, partnership. Uh, we've uh, we have an MOU in place uh, earlier in 2019 uh, that spells out uh, a whole host of different obligations and, and uh, requirements of the project. Both the shops actually shops because there's multiple uh, structures, um, and then also the work that uh, the CDOT hopes to do um, as a uh, as a neighbor to us. Uh, the, the land is is owned by Larimer County. The, um, the I thought I, I thought I had it on. Is your mic on? I thought it was. There you um, go. It was okay. red. At least you got gotcha. you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, the uh, uh, the property there um, would be uh, split um, into two parcels um, in this arrangement, with uh, with CDOT having to to do further development. But we have been working with them uh, to uh, to do road design uh, that's required to allow for their property to be uh, expanded and, and built on. Um, we are building, you know, currently on the property right next to it that the county owns, and uh, and so we've uh, gone through and, and uh, um, completed, um, at least to date, the uh, the pieces that uh, that the county is responsible for in the MOU and the Memor memorandum of understanding, um, and uh, would like to extend uh, a letter on behalf of the commissioners from the commissioners to uh, to CDOT to to basically ask them to confirm, you know, their timing and and uh, their continued uh, plans to, uh, you know, to build there as well. So that's that's a long-winded version of what uh, what we would like you folks to um, to consider and, and uh, move forward with today. I don't understand the grammar of the first sentence that kind of has that last phrase and as attached. Um, there's an that? MOU that's attached to the letter for reference because we reference the MOU throughout the entire letter. So. The attachment is the MOU. I know, but um, thank you for the collaborative work between the county and CDOT for the conveyance of property and as attached. Uh, that it should be two sentences. I don't know. If I wrote that in my monthly column, Tom you. Clayton yeah. would give me a little red mark yeah. and send it back to me. Work our organizations <laughs> are he, he diagrams all these sentences, see, and like and is there supposed to be something and is attached or which or just, is attached I think or needs, as attached? I don't or? I think that maybe the and is what makes it um, awkward. awkward. It just says as attached. As I mean, attached. I think that's probably okay. Why don't you just make it a new sentence that says the MOU is attached? Okay, that'd be yeah. fine too. That works. Whatever. All right. Uh, colleagues, do you understand what's, um, what's going on here? Yes, it looks good to me. I'm ready to make a motion. John, you okay? Yes, Any sir. comments, questions? Okay, yes, Commissioner Johnson, let's Thank go. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I move to approve the letter to the Colorado Department of Transportation regarding the progress on the redevelopment of the Estes Park Maintenance Shop. Very good. We have a motion. All those in favor signify with an aye. 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 That motion has passed 3 0. And Linda, I'm going to give you this. Thank you. If you want good to make work. any changes, you'll have to get that done and bring it back to me. Yes. Very good. Thanks. All right. Thanks, guys. Thanks very much. Good work. Thank you. It's going to be exciting when that shop's done. It When's it going to be done? Uh, April. Yeah. April 2020? Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. Exciting. Okay. Good. Thank you. Build all through the winter. Okay, county manager update. County manager, what say you? I say <laughs> that I had coordination meetings this week with both of the county's city managers, no town managers this week. So I met with uh, Darren Adbury from the city of Fort Collins and with Steve Adams from the city of Loveland. Both communities had um, updates and things to share, and I told them about the things that we're doing here. So it's it's good to stay in touch with those two organizations. I also had contact with our strategic plan coordinators, particularly on the issue of housing. Um, the gold steward is Heather O'Hare. The objective leader is Jennifer Fairman. Mm -hmm. And the three of us met with Julie... Bruin, Bruin. Bruin from the Housing Catalyst. She's really a nationally recognized expert in housing and housing authorities and has uh, been very generous in, in 
giving of her time and expertise, I think we're going to meet much more often in mm -hmm. understanding about next steps forward. So thank you to Julie and to our two internal staff members who are deeply engaged in other duties really as assigned. Really talented folks, yeah, and we appreciate their work. Yep. Right. And then speaking of talented folks, Josh and Matt and I are continuing yeah. working on the budget. They were out at 10 County last week um, because there's that uh, – the 10 largest counties get together for a budget conference once a year. Josh and Matt both went, but you sure couldn't tell it. They were, their fingers were flying on their keys as, uh, all week as they were at that conference. And so I think we're getting close to the final decision making on the remaining loose ends. So that was my week. Very good. Commissioner Activity Reports, who'd like to begin? Commissioner Johnson? I'll go first since I was at the 10 County Budget Conference with. Josh and Matt, Matt. Mm -hmm. and it actually was a really good conference well worth the 614 mile round trip tr <laughs> drive Jeez. to get there um, who's counting we the keynote speaker was a lady that talked about communication within the organization and different types of individuals that you work with and she wrote a book and did a very long keynote address and that's why I mentioned to Linda that meeting with Josh and Matt about that and I'll bring the materials in and share I think they would be very interesting for Linda and Miranda to to peruse but it was it was a very good conference um, very very good sessions um, were held in Grand Junction yeah oh, fun uh, Commissioner Kavalis. Uh thank thanks mr. chair I'll highlight a few things uh, I attended the uh, Alliance for Suicide Prevention the 10th annual lifesaver breakfast at Timberline Church last Tuesday and of note there is it was well attended and that it's good to in terms of raising money and all of that but uh, I believe the Alliance was one of the 18 recipients of our open grant process I think they may have gotten seven thousand dollars and also of note I think it's important is they are merging with Imagine Zero uh, which focuses a lot on suicide prevention and those kinds of things so I think that's a great um, uh, a, a great idea, uh, you know, to merge together to, to benefit off of each other's experiences and skill sets. I also, on that day, it was referenced earlier, uh, there was a uh, stakeholder engagement meeting. It wasn't my meeting. Uh, I, I, we just, the county um, hosted it. I, I believe I'm allowed to do that. Uh, but it was the um, uh, Division of Housing. There was a bill that was passed in the legislature, House Bill 1309 that deals with the, um, I, I, it's referred to as the Mobile Home Park Oversight Act, and essentially it's dealing with, um, uh, primarily with setting up a dispute resolution mechanism. Uh, as, as many of us know, uh, people who own their mobile homes and live in parks or uh, communities, sometimes there are issues between the landlord and the tenant, the people who uh, uh, pay lot rent, and this is a way of, of trying to address some of those issues, level the playing field perhaps, it was about there were about 40 people there, and I thought it was a good uh, a good meeting. And um, another aspect of that House Bill 1309, which is something we'll need to explore further, is it does give local jurisdictions, uh, counties, uh, more jurisdiction over uh, uh, mobile home parks and you know what we can or cannot do. Then I uh, on Wednesday, I attended the uh, at least part of the North Fort. Excuse me the. Actually, I did not attend that, so I, I, I pass on that. I didn't go to the uh, North Fort Collins Business Association meeting. I decided that I needed to sleep in. Oh, is that on the record? Um, uh, I did have my community conversation in Waverly that evening. Uh, it was a small group, actually. There were only about four or five of us, which was, but we wound up having our meeting on the stoop, and I presume that both of my commissioner colleagues know what a stoop is. Mm -hmm. You bet. Very good. Mm -hmm. uh, moving right along. Um, on Thursday, I, this is what I did attend, the uh, 7th Annual Fort Collins Business Appreciation Breakfast at the Hilton. Uh, the, to me, that's an, uh, an opportunity to um, uh, you know, build relationships between uh, city folks and business folks. Just about done, uh -huh. Mr. Chair. It's okay. I know. Uh, busy guy. Yeah. So well, we're all, we're, we're all busy. Uh, also on Thursday, I did a... Later on that day, I actually went with our, uh, some of our county engineer uh, folks, Mark Peterson and others, 
we did a, a tour uh, uh, the the county line uh, the um, up at Red Feather Lakes the uh, this thank you sir the center line survey so we actually got to um, drive around the various roads uh, in uh, in uh, Red Feather Lakes area that might be considered for future uh, ways of, of dealing with some of those issues and I one conclusion one takeaway was that I would not travel on some of those roads in my Prius yeah. <laughs> um, but that was that was very informative. We had our community conversation. Uh, we had um, Pam and others uh, uh, speak to uh, the, the center line survey update. And then I actually went down to Glacier View Meadows and did a drive around drive along with um, uh, some of the residents there, including the um, the Glacier View Meadow Fire Protection District Chief, and just to kind of see Glacier View Meadows and their yeah. their. Um, their systems there. Uh, finally, um, well, I guess in conclusion, I attended the um, the Saba Soiree. Saba is the Sexual Assault Victim Advocate um, Center's annual fundraiser. Saba a Soiree. And what's Soiree? Well, uh, there's a great picture of me with uh, a former uh, city well for City Councilman Ken Summers. And Gino Campana, uh, they were wearing uh, t tuxedos. I was wearing um, Not a tuxedo. something more casual, but I was dressed up for the occasion. Anyway, I got to sit at a table with uh, the new CSU president and her husband, and a couple of other folks. Again, and I actually, I actually, and maybe someone can follow up on this. I actually invited her to come in Ooh. and maybe speak to us as as our guest. Yeah, I'd like to speak uh, to her. She did that with the city, and I think it would be helpful to do that with the county. So perhaps uh, Linda or and someone could help us uh, and I make send her an email. Did she respond to you? We uh, have been we have been pursuing mm -hmm. such a meeting or did such a introduction with the with but not her not since to get the city meeting that you but, and I let, let's chat about this and see if we can get her here. Uh, in any event, that is all I have to report, Mr. Chair. Thank you. You did a ride along too. Oh, oh yes, thank you. I'll, I I know more about your schedule than you do. Yes, okay. and, and you probably know more about my emails than I do. Is that correct? Yes, yes, probably. Although I'm I'm learning how to use certain words in the subject line. <laughs> um, oh. Oh. No, no, I only use them when it's appropriate. When I it's bet. Not, when <laughs> yeah, he's blocked me. We heard there's blocking of emails, widespread blocking yeah. of emails. But very quickly, um, <laughs> uh, I appreciate uh, the chair reminding me. I did about a three-hour ride-along with um, uh, Lieutenant Jeffrey Van Hook with our, the sheriff's office. And we, we, we went, were up in Wellington. I got to see the annex. We participated a little bit in the, um, uh, the uh, Oktoberfest there. We, we did a drive through Poudre Valley Mobile Home Park. And you know apparently the children and the young people like the little uh, sheriff's, uh, the, the stickers that they hand out. Uh -huh. So that was, that was very informative. Uh, not too much, um, not too much uh, excitement, but I think that's a good thing. Um, when we were at the last thing I'll say is when we were at the um, the uh, I guess it's called the pass on where the next shift that the sergeant is briefing the uh, you know the deputies and the, the the patrol officers, I I got to witness some of that and that was helpful and interesting. And as as people we were leaving, I said you know be 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 safe out there, and that was a reference to Hill Street Blues. The sergeant knew exactly what I was talking about, Sorry. but of the six or seven or eight um, on the youngest side. Uh, uh, patrol officers, only two of them maybe knew what, about Hill Street Blues. I don't, know. Uh, I don't even know about Hill Street Blues. <laughs> anyway, we'll leave it at that. Good we'll leave it Lord. at that. And, and, and again, thank you for your indulgence, Mr. Chair. Oh my gosh. Okay, just uh, two things I wanted to um, prize the board of. The first was the Open Lands Advisory Board, which met last week, and actually um, uh, we did take, uh, they did uh, pass a recommendation on uh, about the Weiss property that the board just uh, considered. Uh, a few hours and uh, a few minutes ago um, the the board um, we had an interesting discussion frankly about oil and gas development in the county and so what the county has done in the past with regards to oil and gas with uh, particularly pertaining to our open spaces and um, obviously we might be in a little bit of a different climate now but we've done some really really positive collaborative work uh, with uh, um, I, I, w I would say environmental groups and and the oil and gas industry to try to um, locate uh, you know areas where where oil and gas development could occur in the past and so 
the, the Open Lands Advisory Board was very interested in that um, to kind of learn a little bit about that history and how, how we'd uh, how we navigated that in the past. It was it was um, it was a good discussion. Fair Board met last week. Um, I I don't know I don't know why, but this year was like the best fair of all time in the last decade. It's Dalen. Dalen didn't have anything to do with Dalen, the fair. And Dalen and Chris Ashby. No, no, Chris Ashby's been here. Stuff. Chris Ashby's been here for several years. I don't know what the thing that changed was, but for some reason, this year's fair was a it, was. My point is, it wasn't you. Unbelievable! In my first year as fair board liaison, I guess I'll go ahead and say it. The fair uh, went to, uh, soared to new heights. M Mr. Chair, I don't think you can declare causation uh, here. Yeah. Maybe correlation. Uh, we'll see. Um, we we had a uh, tremendous uh, tremendous up uptick in the number of folks who uh, you know attended the fair and it was my county the, soapbox the carnival was. Was, was really great and uh, and even though um, there was uh, some uh, kind of a communicable dis livestock disease that was uh, uh, running rampant in the county we yes. still had a we had a great never happened uh, when I was on the I know we had great big. <laughs> Great 4-H participation. We had a great livestock sale, and uh, and so uh, hopefully I'll be able to bring you a little more uh, detail um, next uh, next following next month's meeting. A lot of pork, pork hog when I was on the fair. I know we should get back together. I don't, well, I don't know if Johnny's Johnny meat. meat Does Johnny this meat? Uh, yes, yeah. Mr. Chair, could you tell us about Ziggy? Oh, yeah. the tw Twiggy. Yeah. No, what's Twiggy. Twiggy? He's the water skiing squirrel. He was she. She. And I actually saw her in action. Uh, and it was um, I missed it. it was amazing. I highly recommend it. Next you should get out and see. This is actually like the tenth, I think, Twiggy. Twiggy. I don't know what the lifespan of a squirrel is. It's I'm not, guessing those were custom-made oh, wow. skis. I do it's, remember Twiggy. From it's the not. 60s. It's not long, but I mean, this squirrel lives much, much longer, obviously, than a wild squirrel, because she's not. You know, there's no predators or anything like that, and she wears a life jacket, so she has no risk of drowning. <laughs> But, um, but she, they live a long lifespan, but still I think it's like the 10th the tenth iteration of Twiggy. Uh, and she was going, still going strong and available for photographs for a small fee. Okay, um, there is a legal matter before the board. Uh, last week, uh, the Board of Commissioners considered um, exclusion from the Estes Valley uh, Recreation and Parks District. Um, this is a... Uh, um, this is this would be the execution of the order excluding those properties that, that the board will consider. Yes, sir. And Frank Haug, our Larimer County attorney, is here with us to present this item. Again, uh, I uh, I recused myself from this hearing uh, last participation in this hearing last week um, in 2000 and I think it was early 2017 or maybe perhaps late 2016. I had sent a letter to the Estes Valley Parks and Rec District Board asking them to consider removal of certain properties from the district at that time. Mr. Haug that, felt great. that uh, that pro potentially uh, represented a conflict of interest on my part, so I did not participate in the hearing. So, Frank, go ahead. That's correct, uh, Mr. Chair. And so as a result, you should also not participate in this hearing, which is why I've had it to be signed by uh, Commissioner Kafalis instead. And what I've done is essentially just gone back, listened to that order, listened to the hearing, formalized that into this, and then I'm happy to make any changes if you see any that you'd like to make. But I think um, it should basically just summarize the, the findings that you made last week. If it gets appealed, <clears throat> it's an appeal from you. It's not really an appeal of, anyway, sorry. Go ahead. Um, it's not really an appeal of your decision. Because if the district court does hear it, it'll be decided based on the record, same as yours, decided on the record before the special district board, not on your your deliberation. So the date that's effective will be whenever this is signed, assuming today they'll have 30 days from today's date to appeal it if they want to appeal it. Uh, thank you, Frank. I just want to make sure for the record that uh, anyone who may be listening uh, the chair has recused himself from this meeting. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Commissioner Johnson, do you have any questions? I do not. You're, you're um, proofreading the resolution mm -hmm. as we speak. Mm -hmm. yeah, it looks good. Then I am. Motion? 
then I'm feeling uh, um, reassured. Thank you. Yes, I would welcome a motion, Commissioner Johnson. Mr. Chairman, I move to approve the order excluding certain properties from the Estes Valley Recreation District. That is a proper motion. Uh, all in favor say aye. 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 Thank you. Is there any further business that we must attend to, uh, Madam County Manager? Not today, Commissioner. Then we are adjourned. Thank you.